Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to another reading wrap up. August was probably my slowest reading month in a very long time. I still read things, but I felt like I wasn't reading nearly as much as I usually do, and I wasn't as interested in reading. I think that's kind of over now. Um, things picked up near the end of the month, so this is part two of my August wrap up, and I have more things to talk about this time, so let us get into it. First, I just want to mention that I did finish A Desolation Called Peace by Arkady Martin. I'm planning on doing a separate review of this once I have my thoughts in order. Obviously, there are a ton of sticky tabs in this. I have things to say about it, um, but I'm still kind of putting my thoughts in order about how I feel about this book. I absolutely loved it, but I loved it in a very different way from A Memory Called Empire, which is one of my favorite books of all time. And the experience of reading this and the type of story that it is was really different for me, and I think that is mainly due to the multiple perspectives. You know, A Memory Called Empire was just one point of view. It was just Mahit and her experience and takes Kalan and trying to solve a mystery. This is multiple perspectives stitched together across vast amounts of space, um, though it continues a lot of the same themes of memory and culture and communication. And it's also a first contact story with a very strange and dangerous alien species. So, so much to love in it, but it just felt like a very different type of story to me. So more on this in the future. Next, I want to talk quickly about the comics that I read in the second half of August. First is Witch Hat Atelier Volume 6 by Kamome Shirahama. This is a young adult fantasy um, manga series about a little girl named Coco who is training to be a witch. She doesn't come from a witch family or that sort of background, so the witch world, the magical world, is incredibly new and exciting to her. And a mysterious, kind of exiled, taboo set of the witches are very interested in her for an unexplained reason, though in volume six that has cleared up a little bit about why they are interested in her specifically. I mean, she is an outsider in the witch community and the way that she thinks about magic is very different. So I really liked the plot progress on that front. There's also another new character introduced who I found very interesting and very confusing, but he is connected to Kifri's backstory. Kifri is Coco's teacher. He's a very interesting and cool young man, but it's been majorly hinted that he has a darker side to him and a mysterious past, and we're getting just inching closer to finding out about that. After that, I read volumes 18 and 19 of Lumberjanes. Both of these volumes were written by Shannon Waters and Kat Lee. I think Kanisha Bryant did the artwork in volume 18 and Kat Lee did the artwork in volume 19. I will correct myself in the description down below if I remember that incorrectly. So I'm committed to reading Lumberjanes to the end, insert rant here about how the series has really gone downhill. I don't need to repeat myself again. I think it is kind of pulling up slightly at the end. I quite enjoyed a volume 18. This one is called Horticultural Horizons, I think, and it's a pretty straightforward adventure with all of the characters, all of the girls, with Rosie who runs the camp, and they have their own adventure with her while also learning some stuff about the, the history of the camp and how it was founded, and I really enjoyed that. It's the kind of of historical information that I wish we'd had 10 volumes ago, so I like that. Volume 19, which is called A Summer to Remember, is obviously the penultimate volume. Um, the girls split up for the first time and have their last adventures. Um, each of them has this one last thing that they want to accomplish or do before the end of camp and going home at the end of summer. And I liked this idea because, I mean, obviously um, the whole series so far has been about these girls' uh, friendships and working together and having adventures together, the power of friendship. So seeing them split up for these um, last few issues was interesting. However, I didn't love it quite as much because um, it, it was a bit more Ripley focused. <laughs> it's kind of sad for me because Joe is my favorite character and I've always thought she needed more page time and just wasn't getting it. And then she's finally front and center in this volume, but she's teamed up with Ripley and I don't 
love Ripley. I, I can only take so much Ripley chaos, you know? Volume 20 is coming out in November, I think, and that is the actual conclusion to the series, so I still have my fingers crossed that it will go out with a bang rather than a whimper, but my expectations have been lowered steadily over the past couple of years. <laughs> the last comic that I read was Magnificent Ms. Marvel Volume 1, written by Saladin Ahmed, and the artwork is by Minkyu Jung. This is the second series about Ms. Marvel, who is a Pakistani-American Muslim teenage superhero in the Marvel Universe. Um, this series, as well as the Runaways series, written by Rainbow Rowell right now, are the only two Marvel series that I read. I have no interest in any of the others, and I miss a lot of storyline stuff with the crossovers, th things that happen in other series, which is my own fault, but who has time to read all of these things? Um, so I loved G. Willow Wilson's run on Ms. Marvel. She wrote the, um, the original Ms. Marvel series that kind of launched the character of Kamala Khan. And when that concluded, um, the second series um, with Salada Ahmed launched. And I've been very curious about it. So I finally sat down and read this first volume and I thought the writing was good. I thought the character was still really consistent, and I really liked Minkyu Jung's artwork. I hope that he stays on this, or I think it's he. Whoever they are, I hope that they continue doing the artwork because I think it really suits the series. My one quibble with this is a plot cliche that I really hate. The story is about how Kamala and her parents are whisked off to an alien planet where the inhabitants believe that Kamala is their savior. Um, whether she is or not, she's gonna try to help them. But then that very typical thing happens when they get home where everybody loses their memory of the event except for Kamala. And this really irritated me because it was a major event in Kamala's life. It's when her parents find out that she's a superhero and then all of that is just erased. And I thought it was a major step forward in the plot um, a major development for both Kamala's character, but also her relationship with her parents. And then, and then it's just gone. I really don't like it. I do not like the, and then everyone forgot sort of thing. Whatever. Um, I think there are two more volumes of this currently out, so I'm going to read some more of it and reserve judgment until I've experienced a little bit more of the plots. Now let's talk about some things that I really, really loved, like five-star reads. I read The Tea Dragon Tapestry by Kay O'Neill. I guess I could have loved this in with comics because it is a graphic novel, but for younger readers, whatever. This is the third and probably final book in the Tea Dragon series, which is about all these characters who have these like little tea dragon pets, I guess. Um, they can make tea from the, the things that grow out of, out of the dragons, and that kind of stores the memories and the experiences around the tea dragons. It's kind of difficult to explain, but either way. Um, I've loved how just sweet and cute and warm the series is. There, there's a lot of, I think, good advice in it about characters adjusting to major changes in their lives and deciding what they want to, to do in life. And Tea Dragon Tapestry was really about that. Um, one of the main characters is trying to come to terms with a decision that she's made that's really taken her life in a direction that she wasn't expecting and things like that. It's so, so lovely. I, I love reading this and I really should go back and reread the entire series. I should buy them because they're just absolutely lovely. A completely different type of book that I also loved is Last Night at the Telegraph Club by Melinda Lowe. This one surprised me somewhat. I decided to just pick it up because um, Shannon from That So Po was raving about it earlier this year. So I was like, I need another audiobook to listen to. I'll just try it out. And this captured me so much. What it, What is it about this book? I guess it's kind of billed as young adult historical fiction. I personally approached it like an adult novel. I wasn't really looking at it through the lens of teenage characters coming of age, exploring oneself. It was just something else in my head. Um, not really important, but this is definitely historical fiction. It is about a Chinese-American teenager named Lily who basically is realizing that she is gay, that she is lesbian in 1950s San Francisco in Chinatown. 
and that slow realization meeting um, another girl at school that she has feelings with and together kind of exploring the culture, I guess, um, the sort of underground um, gay and lesbian culture, the Telegraph Club, and how she feels about that with her background, with her her Chinese family, and just her her experience because of her her race, her community, her culture, the expectations on her, but also how she thinks of herself as, you know, an American teenager. I guess, like, the coming of age aspect really got to me in this, but also that sort of awakening of queer longing, of queer identity, and trying to understand that, to understand that that's actually a thing in a time where it's heavily suppressed and not talked about. And how does one have a life where you get to be who you want to be, you know, in 1950s, in a, in a Chinese community in America at that time. It was beautiful. And I, I really don't know what it was about it that just pulled me in, but I started listening to the audiobook and I couldn't stop. I was just sucked into it for hours at a time. I ended up buying my own copy of the audiobook to finish it when I had to, when I, when I lost the audiobook on Overdrive. So it was really wonderful. I would highly recommend it. And you know, whether in print or an audiobook would probably be great, but I, I would definitely recommend the narration of the audiobook in particular. And now I'm down to just two quick reads to mention. The first is Antony and Cleopatra by William Shakespeare. This is, is this a historical play or a tragedy or a problem play? I don't know. Um, it's the story of Antony and Cleopatra. Antony is a Roman general who takes up with Cleopatra and then fights war against other Roman generals because stuff happens. I'm massively oversimplifying here. I knew the bare bones of the story, probably from history lessons, but it didn't particularly interest me. So I found the story itself to be kind of meh. And I'm not sure that I would even care more about it if I saw it performed. But as always with Shakespeare, um, I did enjoy just finding the context for the famous quotations. Um, because with every Shakespeare play, I come across those sections that get quoted a lot, and I'm like, oh, that's where that's from. And for a play like this, uh, which isn't as well known, which isn't talked about as much, um, I really didn't know the context. So get, getting to explore that was, was kind of nice. But this one, I don't know if I'd even ever reread it. And then lastly, I have this teeny tiny little book called The Hummingbird's Gift, Wonder, Beauty, and Renewal on Wings by Cy Montgomery. It's a little tiny book about the beauty and fragility of hummingbirds. It's the story of how Cy Montgomery helped a friend of hers um, take care of these two tiny orphaned hummingbird babies. Um, her friend specializes in rescuing hummingbirds, and it's, it's a really good story in, in that regard, and you you learn a lot about hummingbirds, but I was kept thinking that there should have been more. Like, why? Why do we just have this little book on this particular story? It turns out that this is a chapter from a previous book by Cy Montgomery that's just been repackaged on its own with a new introduction. I don't know why they did that. Um, so it was a lovely little read, but it didn't like wow me or anything. My mom gave this to me because this is the first year that I personally have ever seen hummingbirds in the wild. I've come face to face with a couple of them in my yard, probably because I have some flowers and bushes that they like, and it's probably been like a good year for hummingbirds here. But it was pretty amazing because I just, I'd never seen one in person before. And now I want to plant all the flowers and bushes that they might like so that I'll see them regularly. <laughs> So anyway, that is the rest of my reading from August. A pretty good batch. For a while there, I was reading like just a string of five-star books, and that is always a great feeling. So let me know if you have also read any of these, or if you want to, leave me a comment down below. I would love to hear from you. Thank you for watching, and I'll be back to talk to you again soon. And until then, bye.